The Moro arc occurs after the events of the Tournament of Power and the Dragon Ball Super Broly movie. The story starts with the narrator letting us know that some time has passed. Vegeta is waiting at Capsule Corp when Goku teleports behind him. Where have you been? Said Vegeta to Goku. Oh, you know, Goku responds. Anyway, are we gonna train or what, Vegeta? Not here. The neighbors would complain. Let's use the gravity room. In the panel below, Goku and Vegeta clash in Vegeta's gravity chamber. On the next page, Vegeta says to Goku, So what happened with you and Ultra Instinct? Goku responds, Nothing much. Haven't pulled it off since the tournament. Vegeta then says, So you can't tap into it at will. What a useless technique. Then Goku says, Guess not. No shortcuts in training, huh? Just gotta keep grinding away. Especially because I'd never intend to fight side by side with you again, said Vegeta. Fine by me, Goku says, because I prefer to take my own enemies by myself. At that moment though, their training is interrupted by a beeping sound. Vegeta, Son Goku, can you come outside? It's Boma. She says, we've got an urgent call from Hercule. A bit confused, Goku says to himself, Hercule? What's up, Boma? Goku says to Boma, walking out of the gravity room with Vegeta. I'm not quite sure yet, Boma responds. Some mysterious gang showed up at Hercule's place, and it sounds like they're kidnapping Boo. Kidnapping Boo? Vegeta responds, surely you jest. <laughs> it's easy to forget that creature is incredibly powerful. With a serious look, Goku says, so we're looking at new villains? Boma responds, don't know, hard to say. Vegeta, looking off in the sky, says, I'm not sensing any powerful energy signatures. Goku says to him, guess we'd better go check it out. What a nuisance, Vegeta says. Come on, Vegeta. Goku preparing to instantly teleport there, extends his hand to Vegeta. Vegeta responds saying, get going on your own. I can fly to Hercule in five seconds. On the next panel, we're at Hercule's mansion. He's yelling at a mystery group. What are you gonna do to Boo? I swear, if you take him from me, give Boo back, he yells. You're kidnapping my friend. Hercule then takes a gun out of his kimono and says, no choice but to count this as self-defense. He yells, eat this, as he fires a shot at one of the mystery kidnappers. I'm sorry, but yelling eat this as you do anything is, is hilarious. I think collectively we should bring that back. Anyway, the kidnapper, however, turns around, grabs his own gun, and shoots the bullet Hercule fired mid-air with a laser before it could connect to anything. He then started to respond, Hercule, as I just explained, we are, and then Goku appears next to Hercule. Goku, it's you, Hercule says. What are you people up to? Goku says to the mystery man as Vegeta lands next to him. What do you want with Boo? You're definitely bad guys, right? The mystery man responds, Goku and Vegeta? The Goku and Vegeta? At the same time, Hercule is begging. Please, oh please, you gotta save Boo. Goku with a smile on his face goes, I'm on it. He quickly teleports to the kidnappers and begins to systematically knock each of them out with a single blow. The mystery man seeing this happen says, it seems you leave me no choice as he reaches for his laser gun. He somehow manages to teleport behind Goku and shoots Goku in the back before Goku could react. Both Vegeta and Hercule are shocked. Hey Kakarot, Vegeta says. In that moment, the mystery man also teleports behind Vegeta, saying to himself, I'm sorry, but you're taking a short nap too. Shooting Vegeta in the back and telling his team, carry these two onto the spaceship as well. They will aid in our cause. I'll explain everything to them back at headquarters. Okay, let me just pause there for a quick second. The first time I read this, I was very upset by this scene. Who is this new guy? How could he speed blitz Goku and Vegeta so easily? Why wasn't this guy in the tournament of power if he's this powerful? I had a lot of questions. But let me just say, this all gets explained pretty well in the future of this arc. So for now, Let's keep going. Goku and Vegeta are loaded onto a spaceship and taken from Earth. On the next page, we see Goku starting to wake up to a voice yelling, Yo Goku, hey, I'm talking to you. Eventually, the voice yells, Wake up Goku. And we see that it's Jacko, the Galactic Patrolman. Goku wakes up holding his head, saying, Ow, what was I doing? Jacko responds, Sleeping like a baby. Our stun gun packs a punch, huh? Goku then goes, Oh, it's you, Jacko. Vegeta now waking up goes, Uh. Jacko says, Not sure why he brought you two and Majin Buu would have been enough. Goku says, Huh? Brought? Where are we? And then on the next page, we see that Goku and Vegeta and Buu have been transported to the headquarters of the Galactic Patrol. Vegeta, speaking for the first time, says, Galactic Patrol, you say? And then, 
the mystery man standing behind Jackal finally speaks. He says, I apologize for getting rough with you two. You didn't seem to be in a mood to listen to reason. So Goku cuts him off by saying, so who are you? Then the person behind the mystery man introduces him by saying, as one of our elite agents, Miris here manages 104 sectors. Jacko smugly says, that's a few more than even me. Goku turns to Jacko and says, so how many sectors do you manage, Jacko? He says, um, three. Vegeta cutting them both off says, if he's so elite, what does he need from Boo? Then Jacko responds by saying, right, due to our negligence, a dastardly criminal has broken out of the Galactic Patrol prison. To recapture this villain, we require the assistance from a certain individual. Who is that, Goku says. Spit it out already, said Vegeta. Miris responds by saying, someone who slumbers within your own Majin Buu, the great Lord of Lords. And we see a picture of the Grand Supreme Kai. Now, just as a quick heads up, the Grand Supreme Kai, AKA the Daiokai Shin, or the great Lord of Lords, is the leader of all the Kais. Before Dragon Ball Super, he would have been the highest authority in the entire universe. Technically, he should have even higher authority than the angels, but as far as rank, he is on par with Beerus. Remember that even though the angels are stronger than the gods of destruction, on the universal scale, they're technically lower in rank and authority. So in the same way Beerus gets the final say in destruction, this guy would get the final say in cultivating life for universe seven. And this is who Majin Buu absorbed to become Fat Buu. In the next chapter of this story, we are going to get into the role the Grand Supreme Kai played in all of this. The story starts with a flashback from 10 million years ago. The Grand Supreme Kai and the South Supreme Kai are standing on an asteroid in space that's being attacked with comets. They both managed to dodge the first wave of attacks, leaping out of the way, when the South Supreme Kai yells, more incoming. One of the comets crash into the Grand Supreme Kai, while the South Supreme Kai yells in concern, Great Lord of Lords. At first it looks like he's being crushed, but then in the next panel, we see that the Daiokai Shin was strong enough to catch the comet. He says, phew, that was close. While the South Supreme Kai looking a bit beaten up says, unbelievable, attacking us with comets. In the next panel, we see who the attacker is. And this is the first shot we get of Moro. He's hooded and we can't exactly see his face yet, but we can see horns protruding out the side of his head. Moro is smiling and controlling the comets for his attack. He then raises one of his arms and points it towards a nearby planet. On the next page, we see that the life forms on that planet are being drained of their key of their life force. Moro is performing something similar to a forced spirit bomb. He gathers all the energy into a ball and condenses it outside of his right hand. The two Supreme Kais are shocked by this. One of them say he's destroyed another planet. Then Moro takes the energy, balances it on one finger and swallows it. Instantly, he begins to radiate energy, sending waves of ki down to the Supreme Kais. Looking up at him, the South Supreme Kai says, absurd. I think he's gotten even stronger. While the Daiokai Shin says, damn it, we can't win. Off to the side, the fight is being observed by some ancient galactic patrol police. The panel lets us know that these are the predecessors of the current day galactic patrol. Moro lands on the asteroid in front of the Kais. The South Supreme Kai says, if his power grows any further, we'll be helpless to resist. While the Daiokai Shin says, if only we could do something about his magic. He then says, I've got no choice. I'll use up my god power to steal his magic. Huh? Said the South Kai. Does such a technique exist? The Daiokai Shin responds, I created it. I had a feeling it might come in handy one day. It's far too dangerous to teach anyone else. Then the great Lord of Lords hands begin to glow. He yells, Kai Kai Mataru, as he fires a key blast at Moro. The key blast connects while engulfing the entire asteroid they were standing on. In the next panel, we see Moro in a cage and the Daiokai Shin being held up by the South Supreme Kai. He says, you galactic police boys can handle it from here. While the narrator lets us know that the great Lord of Lords gave up most of his godly power in order to seal away Moro's magic. Unable to fight back, Moro was locked away in the galactic prison. Back to the current day, Mira says, while Moro was still a capable fighter even without magic, so he was sentenced to death. 
Unfortunately, nobody could actually kill him, so he was instead given life imprisonment. Vegeta responds to Mira saying, and this Moro is still alive even after 10 million years. Yes, Miris responds. Goku says, whoa, this guy is old. So he managed to escape, huh? Miris continues, correct. It's likely that Moro has regained his magic. So we require the great Lord of Lords power to capture this criminal once again. Vegeta then says, so what does any of this have to do with Boo? Miris responds to him by saying, years after Moro's capture, the great Lord of Lords was absorbed by Majin Buu. Goku looking at Vegeta says, oh, didn't you know that, Vegeta? Vegeta says no. Miris continues, Our only hope is to somehow extract the great Lord of Lords ability from within Majin Buu. Vegeta responds by saying, Whatever your plan, it wasn't your stun gun that put Majin Buu down. He was sleeping to start with, right? It could be days before he awakens. On the next page, we see that Vegeta is right. Majin Buu is still fast asleep, and one of the galactic patrolmen tries to wake him up. He goes, Hello? Rise and shine, Boo grabs him by the neck and tosses him across the room. The patrolman stands up, saying to himself, talk about tossing and turning. As Boo mumbles to himself, Jacko says to Goku, will nothing wake him up? Goku responds to him saying, that's just the kind of guy he is. Responding to this, Mira says, that is a problem. Still, we haven't actually ascertained Moro's location yet, so we're on standby. Goku responds saying, I know. How about we help you catch this guy? Looking excited, Mira says, yes. If it's not too much to ask, Goku says, we're happy to. Sounds fun, right, Vegeta? Vegeta looks annoyed. He says to himself, first they drag us here, now they ask us for a favor? Mira responds to Vegeta by saying, rumors of you two have reached us. You're supposedly quite powerful. Goku, <laughs> being bashful <laughs> says while laughing i don't know about that since there's still stronger people out there in the universes we even ran into another saiyan recently mira says oh do tell meanwhile vegeta's off by himself thinking about the situation in his mind he says this miris i can read his key but he's far from weak he didn't just exploit an opening he was agile enough to get the drop on us in an instant that speaks to his skill on the next page Mira says to Goku and Vegeta, if you'll come this way, the Galactic King is waiting to hold the induction ceremony. Goku says, Galactic King? Who's that? Jacko appalled, responds by saying, fool, he was there when you fought Universe 6. Goku then says, oh, the octopus looking guy? Then the king shows up, who does look like an octopus with a crown on his head, saying, I'm no octopus. Goku takes one of his tentacles, shaking it like you would someone's hand, and says, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. The king responds to Goku by saying, as I mentioned before, that's not a tentacle. I mean, so tell us then, King, what is it? Like, because I feel like you're implying it's something that's not kid friendly. On the next page, Goku and Vegeta are attending an induction ceremony for the Galactic Patrol. The Galactic King starts by saying, Ahem. This induction concerns Son Goku, also known as Kakarot, and Vegeta the Fourth. You two are hereby appointed as special members of the Galactic Patrol. Your tenure lasts until the escaped prisoner, Moro, is recaptured. You will be immediately dismissed if you are found abusing your authority. Examples of abuse include cutting in line to buy a parfait, claiming relevance to an investigation, flaunting the Galactic Patrol symbol in order to hit on girls. On the panel below, Jacko is showing Goku and Vegeta their new Galactic Patrol uniform. Check it out, Goku Vegeta, he says. We've got official uniforms for you too. Goku says, um, I don't wanna wear that. Mira stepping in says, we won't force you but the rules do state that you need to bear our symbol. Another galactic patrolman draws the galactic symbol onto Goku and Vegeta, and with that, the two are officially inducted as galactic patrol officers. At that very moment, some other galactic patrol officers hurry past the room that Goku and Vegeta are standing in. Miris asks what's going on, and they let him know that the Makarini siblings have stolen something again. Goku asks, who's that? And Jacko lets him know that it's a group of punks who always violate the law. Miris turns to them and says, pardon me, but I'll be back shortly. Please just wait here in the meantime. But then Vegeta says, and I love this, Vegeta says, I'm going as well. And then straight up to Miris' face, he says, I want to see what you're made of. Goku looking at Vegeta says, oh, good thinking, I'll come too. And then Mira smiles and responds, as you wish. So the whole team heads off to deal with this Macarini crew. Well, really for Miris to deal with it and for Goku and Vegeta to observe. The party arrives at Planet Jump, where the local police are chasing a train. On the next page, we get a look at the Macarini siblings, and they are holding the train conductors hostage. Miris and the crew 
pull up alongside the train in their spaceship. The Macarini sister says, Big bro, look, the Galactic Patrol, the brother responds, should have known. I'll shoot them out of the sky. Keep a close eye on the hostages, Getty. Yep, said the smaller brother. At the same time, the ship door opens to show Miris, Goku, and Vegeta standing there, Jacko in the background. So you're after Blue Aram, Miris says. What is Blue Aram? Goku asks Jacko. A fuel source for all sorts of machines, Jacko responds. Like how on earth you've got sky gold, I guess. Oh, so it's worth a lot? Goku says. It's pretty valuable. Jacko respond, but it's really bad if criminals get their mitts on it. With as much as they got down there, they could build a planet busting bomb. Yikes, that sound bad, Goku responds. As Maris leaps from the ship onto one of the train cars, Maris picks up a piece of the blue orum and says, stealing a whole train worth of blue orum. This is their most audacious caper yet. The way this guy talks, I mean, something has to be up with Maris because I'm getting strong, hello fellow humans vibe. Anyway, just then, the oldest Macarini sibling jumps on top of the train behind Miris and fires a shot at him, which Miris easily dodges. If it ain't Miris, how long has it been? Said the Macarini sibling. Pasta, Miris responds. I'm not punching out today until the three of you are locked up in galactic prison. There's a standoff between the two as Pasta raises both hands, his gun in one of them. He says, whoa there, that was just me saying hi. I'd never actually go toe to toe with you. Miris responds, then throw down your fire Firearm. Pasta says, sure, sure, as he secretly infuses his gun with some of his key. Miris, pointing his laser gun at Pasta, says, hurry up. Pasta says, fine, and tosses his gun in the air. Whoops, he says. The gun lands on the train car connection between the two as Pasta snaps his finger, causing a giant explosion. Goku, Vegeta, and Jacko are still observing the situation from the Galactic Patrol ship. As Pasta yells to one of his siblings, Penne, our friends change in tracks. Penne, the female Macarini sister, extends her arm like Piccolo, hitting the switch on the railway, forcing the disconnected train cars that Miris is standing on to go in a different direction. Just then, Pasta pulls a giant shotgun from behind his back and destroys the train tracks ahead of Miris as his own train makes its way into a tunnel. That jerk, Jacko says, that was shady. See ya, Miris, Pasta said. Now go boom, along with all that blue aura. There's a close-up of Miris with a look of resolve on his face. He then jumps off of the train and activates a pair of rocket boots that allows him to fly. He flies ahead of the train cars and starts pushing them backwards before they can go flying off the broken railway. He manages to stop the cars in the nick of time. Right then, he radios in to Jacko saying, Agent Jacko, request and retrieval of the blue orb. I'll head them off at the tunnel exit. Darn, Jacko responds as he activates his own rocket boots and flies down to where Miris is standing. Goku and Vegeta are just standing there checking out the situation as Goku says, I guess that's how these galactic patrol guys fly around. Right then, Vegeta says, wait, Miris is gone. Goku points and says, oh, he's already over there. As Miris sprints along the top of the tunnel, doing a frontal flip, landing on the first train car as it exits. He looks inside the train and the Macarini siblings are missing with only the two tied up train conductors. One of them say they already made their getaway. The other one says probably in that spaceship. Oh no, Jacko says off to the side, carrying all the cars of Blue Arum in one hand. Jacko's strong. He notices that the final car of Blue Arum is missing as well and says, the cargo is gone too. On the panel below, we can see the Macarini siblings escaping on a spaceship with the last car of Blue Arm tied under it. Haha, ha, Pasta says. See you later, galactic morons. <laughs> Just then, the entire ship shakes as Goku lands on the front of it. What the heck? Who are you, Pasta says. You're not getting away, Goku says through the glass. He's galactic patrol. He can fly? No fair. Miris, Goku yells. I caught the bad guys. Stopping the train with one hand and looking up at Goku, Miris says, I appreciate the assistance. Meanwhile, standing on the ship, Vegeta notices that Miris had already sabotaged one of the thrusters on the Macarini ship. He says to himself, Miris, he'd already tampered with their spaceship, ensuring they wouldn't get far. Even if Kakarot hadn't caught them, it wouldn't have mattered. Stopping the train took priority because he wanted to save the conductors. Annoyed, Vegeta says, so how'd he have time to sabotage their ship? Damn it. I somehow missed that. And let me just pause here for a quick second and say this is a big deal because what Miris did here 
is more than just speed blitzing everyone. It's more of like a, a perception blitz. Goku and Vegeta were literally unable to track him in that time where he sabotaged the spaceship and got back on the top of the tunnel to stop the train. And they're used to fighting gods. Later on in the story, we learn that Jacko has better eyesight than pretty much everyone. It's one of his special powers. And even he wasn't able to see what Miris did. So this is a big deal. It feels to me almost like Miris is using time manipulation Population, similar to what Hit does. And let me just say I love this about Vegeta because Goku didn't even seem to notice this, but Vegeta is paying attention. Something is up with Miris. Anyway, let's continue. On the next page, the Macarini siblings are behind bars on the Galactic Patrol ship as they all head back to headquarters. Jacko says, ha ha ha, this is what happens when you tangle with us elites. Goku says to him, you didn't really do anything though. Right then, Vegeta approaches Miris and says, you could have saved the day even quicker, couldn't you? You're hiding your power, right? My eyes don't lie. Again, this is why I like Vegeta, straight to it. Miris responds to him and says, hardly. Yes, I wanted their spaceship too, so I let them flounder a bit longer, but hiding my power? No. Vegeta then says, I suppose you aren't capable of capturing this Moro on your own then. Miris responds, I'm afraid not. I may be number one in the Galactic Patrol, but Moro is in another league altogether. Miris continues, Moro's power knows no limits. What? Goku responds. You mean he's getting stronger and stronger? Yes, Miris says. So if we don't capture him soon, things will go from bad to worse. Just then, the pilot announces that they are receiving a report. A report from where? Said Miris. Kusea's squad was out scouting and got a lock on Moro's location. The pilot responds, nice, about time, Goku says. Passing through sector KT-40, he didn't get as far as we expected. Which way is that? Goku asks Miris. Like, which direction? That way, Jacko points. Okay, let me do a quick search of my own, Goku says. What does that mean? Jacko asks Vegeta. He can maybe sense the criminal's key if he knows where to look, Vegeta tells him. Putting two fingers to his forehead, Goku closes his eyes. Searching through the vacuum of space, he senses Moro. And for the first real time in the arc, we meet the big villain. As Goku senses Moro, Moro is able to sense him back. Moro smiles and Goku is shocked. What is it, Kakarot? Vegeta says to Goku. Did you find Moro's key? Let me try. No, Vegeta, don't. He could sense that I was searching for him. How could that be? Vegeta said to Goku. I don't know. It's like nothing I've felt before. To think he could do that, Vegeta said. Well, what else could you send? Was it a massive key signature? No, not quite, Goku responds. More like God key then, Vegeta asks. No, his key itself wasn't that huge, but it was terrifying. I've never felt anything like it. It's as if a whole lot of people were screaming in pain. Miris lets Goku know that Moro is known for absorbing the life force of planets and turning it into his own power. In that sense, Mira says, his very energy is a mass of slaughtered souls. Goku says, so how many people has he killed? Miris responds, it's more like entire planets, far too many to count. On the next page, we finally get to see what Moro has been up to since escaping from the Galactic Patrol prison. He's partnered up with an old member of the Frieza Force named Cranberry. Cranberry told Moro about the Dragon Balls on planet Namek. Because of that, they're both on their way to new Namek to gather the Dragon Balls and wish for Moro to restore his magical power. But no one in the Galactic Patrol knows Moro's plan yet. However, based on the direction the ship is headed in, Miris, Goku, and Vegeta are able to figure out Moro's intent. They know he's heading to New Planet Namek, and so Goku and Vegeta decide to get there before him. Goku uses instant transmission, but as he's leaving, Miris tries to stop them, saying, confronting Moro now is far too dangerous. Obviously, Goku and Vegeta know they're much stronger than Moro and teleport to New Namek anyway. They arrive in the middle of a Namekian village. Goku says, Heya, remember me? The Namekian elder says, Oh, son Goku, it's wonderful to see you in good health. Goku says, Yep, I'm doing good, thanks. But before the conversation could go any further, Vegeta says, Look, Kakarot, he's already here. Moro, looking down from his ship, says, the one seeking me earlier has come to this planet. Huh? Said Cranberry. Moro continues, I don't know how he crossed such a distance, but it would seem he's here to apprehend me. Cranberry responds, Darn Galactic Patrol. They obviously don't value their lives if they're itching to tangle with you, Moro. Moro smiles and says, This one has spectacular energy. Back on the planet, Goku tells the Namekians what's going on and let them know 
that they need to gather the Dragon Balls and run far away. Very well, the Elder says. The village begins to clear out just as Moro is landed. Vegeta says to Goku, you're right about his ominous key, but he's not particularly strong. Is this truly the monster Miris warned us of? Goku says, hard to say, but I have a bad feeling about this. At the same time, Moro lands on new planet Namek. Moro steps off of the spaceship facing Goku and Vegeta. He takes a deep breath and says, my first breath of fresh air in 10 million years. As though I'm born again. Vegeta with a smirk says, why it's nothing but a feeble old man. Goku responds and says, makes sense given how long he's lived. On the spaceship, Cranberry recognizes Vegeta. He says, isn't that Vegeta? Why is he here? Vegeta speaking directly to Moro says, hey, I'm guessing you're Moro, right? We hear you've done some nasty things. Goku follows up and says, so how about you turn around and go right back to prison? Moro, ignoring them, senses a Namikian child left in one of the village houses. He smiles. Then he raises his right hand and pulls the Namikian child towards him, catching him by the neck. What? Vegeta says. Oh no, Goku yells. What's your scheme? Let him go. Moro responds to them saying, worry not. This one is merely food. The other Namikians, realizing that someone is missing, go, wait. Where's Eska? Has anyone seen Eska? Right there, Moro begins to suck the life out of this Namekian child. Stop, Goku says, preparing to charge Moro. But Vegeta speed blitz them both, kicking Moro's hand away from the young Namekian, Eska. Vegeta lands behind Moro, gently holding the young Namekian, and sends him back to the village elder. Just want to talk about this moment for Vegeta for a little bit because this arc, in my opinion, starting with this image, really shows how much Vegeta has grown as a character, as a person. Gotta remember during the Frieza arc when Vegeta first went to planet Namek, he was willing to indiscriminately kill Namikians and now here he is saving them. Moro turns around looking at Vegeta and says, you would dare interrupt my long awaited meal. Vegeta looking directly at him responds, I have a troubled history with these Namikians. I did them untold harm. So no, I can't allow even one more of them to perish and they most certainly are not your food. Kakara, let me take this one. Goku responds and says, Sure, but we still don't know much about his power, so be careful. Vegeta transforms into a Super Saiyan. He says to Moro, they say you use magic, just try it. You believe you can apprehend me? Moro responds, your ignorance runs deep. Vegeta charges at Moro and throws a punch that Moro manages to dodge. And with this, the fight begins. Here Moro shows that he's far more agile than he looks. He's able to dodge Super Saiyan Vegeta's attacks pretty consistently. In his pursuit of him, Vegeta lands on the ship and Cranberry notices that Vegeta has joined the Galactic Patrol. Moro flips backwards and uses his magic to manipulate the gravity around Vegeta. It sends Vegeta slamming into the ground and before he can do anything, Moro lifts him up again with his magic and sends him flying into a pile of rocks. Moro smirks. Off to the side, Goku says, special powers, huh? But then, there is a burst of red light from the area where Vegeta landed. Moro shields his eyes, and for the first time in the manga, we get to see Super Saiyan God Vegeta. Vegeta says, shall we continue? This was a bit of a hype moment because for the longest people were speculating as to whether Vegeta had the Super Saiyan God transformation or not. Then we saw it in the Broly movie, but the movies and the manga are slightly different, so no one really knew if it existed in the manga canon and then Vegeta does this. Anyway, let's continue. Super Saiyan God, red-haired Vegeta, charges Moro, dodging the magic attacks. He delivers a right punch that Moro manages to block, but then quickly follows up with a kick to Moro's chin, sending him flying. Moro is shocked while Vegeta smirks, but he's able to recenter himself and flips into a landing. Vegeta says to him, I was curious to see for myself what sort of beast could terrify the Galactic Patrol. How disappointing. While he's talking, Moro uses his magic to snap a, a tree and sends it flying towards Vegeta. Vegeta shoots it out of the sky without even looking at it. Moro then sends a series of rocks and debris at Vegeta and Vegeta waves his hand destroying them all. He says, we've come up against plenty of bizarre powers in our fights. So this is nothing new. The story then quickly flashes back over to Miris, where the pilot of the ship asks him, what should we do? Should we go to New Namek 2? Miris responds and says, no, let's head back to HQ. Majin Buu's aid is indispensable. 
but Miris, there's a decent chance they've already taken down Moro, Jacko says. Those two are strong, a teeny weeny bit stronger than even me. Miris says, even so, it's very unlikely that they'll win. So this is interesting because Vegeta is clearly dominating Moro, but Miris still seems to think that Goku and Vegeta are going to lose. So let's continue. Back to the fight, Moro stares at Vegeta, rips off his cloak and smiles. He says, you hope to witness my magic as you wish then. So you've been holding back then, Vegeta says, as Moro smirks. Off to the side, Goku says, we've heard about how you can absorb life energy, just like what you tried to do with that Namikian kid a minute ago. Still smirking, Moro responds, oh, you're not entirely ignorant then. This will be the same technique, but a bit different. Watching the fight from the ship, Cranberry says, is Moro gonna use that same terrifying move he did when he broke out of prison? Maybe I should put some distance between me and this fight. The story then flashes back over to Miris, where we get a bit more context as to why he thinks Goku and Vegeta are going to lose. Jacko, still talking to Miris, says, so the energy absorber move is the one to watch out for? Miris responds, yes, and it involves more than just absorbing a planet's life energy. The existing records indicate that he can wield the massive energy he steals from planets for direct attacks. Back to the fight, Moro begins powering up. Around him, the ground starts to crack and lava begins to shoot from new planet Namek. Vegeta is shocked and in his slight distraction, Moro flicks one of his fingers using a burst of lava from the planet as an attack on Vegeta. The attack connects and Vegeta does take some damage, but he lands more confused than hurt. Moro says, with this move, I attack with the life energy of the very planet we stand on. The magnitude comes from not my own power, but from the planet itself. And I must say, this planet Namek possesses exceptional energy. With that, he continues his barrage of attacks on Vegeta, lava shooting out of the ground every time he lands. Vegeta then decides to fly up into the sky. Damn it, he says, looking down at Moro. I guess I have to escape into the air. But then Goku yells, Vegeta, be careful. He turns around to see giant pillars of lava getting ready to crash into him. Some distance away, the elder Namikian can see bits of the fight. He says, the land itself is quaking. What sort of battle is being waged? Moro stands on the surface of molten rock as Vegeta breaks through the hardened magma that engulfed him a second ago. He charges at Moro. At the same time, however, Moro pulls up another wall of lava to protect himself from Vegeta's attack. Vegeta stops his attack short to avoid damaging himself. Staring at him through the lava, Moro says, it's no use. You cannot lay a single finger on me. Then he twirls more lava around his hand, tossing it at Vegeta. Vegeta flips backwards, dodging the attack. Off to the side, Goku says, Vegeta, let me take a shot. Shut up, Kakarot, Vegeta responds. Just watch. Hey, Moro, he says. Surely you'll reach your own limit soon if you keep using that move. All I need to do to win is to keep dodging it. Moro smirks and says, this technique effectively has no limits. I may use it until the planet itself is extinguished. That can't be, Vegeta says. Damn it, if I can't approach, I have no hope of recapturing you. And without any more power-ups, I'm at a loss. So this part was interesting because as a reader, it's like, we all know Vegeta has Super Saiyan Blue in his, in his back pocket. So what did he mean by without any more power-ups? Anyway, the story continues. Moro says, admit and defeat, how gracious of you. Tell me one thing at least, Vegeta says. What are you really after? Why come to Namek? What use do dead men have for such information? Vegeta says, Depending on your true goal, maybe you're better off not killing us. Moro, smiling, says, Begging for your life, are you? How far the Galactic Patrol has fallen. He then continues, You seem more knowledgeable about this planet than me. And if you're agreeing to cooperate, I've come in search of something called the Dragon Balls. Thought so, Vegeta says to himself. I understand that one must gather all seven. Moro continues, you wouldn't happen to know anything about that, would you? Vegeta then responds, Sorry to say, I'm unclear on this detail. As I thought, you two were inconsequential, Moro says, clenching his fist and sending another giant wall of lava at Vegeta. Vegeta pushes it all back with a key blast, but the attack was just a distraction because in that instant, he senses Moro behind him with another attack, more lava aimed at Vegeta's back. Vegeta barely manages to turn in time, reinforcing his hands with Ki holding the attack back. In his struggle, he says to Moro, just tell me, what would you wish for? All this power you possess, isn't that already enough? Hardly, Moro says. At the height of my power, you would have been an insect before me. And this entire planet 
a quick meal, but such a feat is currently beyond me, as my long confinement has left me in this decrepit state. I see, Vegeta says. So you would wish to regain your full strength, precisely my goal. Then Vegeta laughed. Really, he says, you're just rotten scum. Just like they told us. Scum worth killing for sure. Moro, confused, looks at Vegeta. And then, definitely one of the coolest transformations we've seen. Vegeta begins to transform into Super Saiyan Blue while pushing back the lava attack. His transformation starts at his legs and works his way up his body. He closes his eyes in Super Saiyan God form and opens them as a Super Saiyan Blue. He then easily pushes Moro's attack away, but Moro is able to dodge the Ki Blast. Vegeta smirks, while Moro says, you were concealing this strength like you were hiding your true intent, Vegeta responds. Off on his ship, Cranberry says, what? Vegeta just powered up even more. Goku says, let him get all cocky so he'd talk. Smooth move, Vegeta. Moro then summons a giant wall of lava, sending it all at Vegeta at once. But in Super Saiyan Blue, Vegeta very easily dodges the attack, smiling the entire time as he charges at Moro. He jumps above it all and delivers a powerful kick to Moro's midsection. This sends Moro crashing into a nearby lake. Cranberry on the ship says, when he gets so strong, yikes, if Moro actually loses, I'm heading back to the slammer. And then Vegeta falls back into his base form. Off to the side, Goku looks at his hands as Moro slowly rises from the lake. I don't care what sort of villain you are, but I won't sit by while this planet suffers, Vegeta says, which means you need to be eliminated. Be on guard, Vegeta, Goku yells to him. Something weird is going on. At the same time, Cranberry tries to run. I ain't going back to prison, he says. This is my chance to split. Noticing this, Moro fires a wave of key blasts at Goku and Vegeta, lands on a rock in front of them, and begins to muster another giant attack of lava. But this attack is different. Goku and Vegeta notice something happening around them. Moro is absorbing the key of the planet and its inhabitants. All the Namekians begin noticing that their energy is forcefully being drained. Something's wrong with the planet, one of them say as he collapses. Goku says to Vegeta, shouldn't we just attack while he's charging up? Moro then squeezes his giant ball of lava and key into a small sphere. And instead of tossing it at Goku and Vegeta, he opens his mouth and swallows it pause, but that's what he did. What the? Goku says. He ate it, Vegeta says, as Moro begins to power up again. Smiling at Goku and Vegeta, he says, the first meal in a long time does the body good. I get it, Vegeta says. So that's how you go about absorbing energy. Moro then notices Cranberry trying to escape and uses his magic to forcefully land the ship. He says, calm your nerves, Cranberry. I shall not lose. Observe from there. Yes, Cranberry responds, scared out of his mind. Does he seem way stronger than before? Goku says, of course, Vegeta says. This is why Miris was eager to recapture you promptly. Why don't we hurry up and settle this then? Oh, try me if you can, Moro says with a smile. You think your little boost was enough to surpass us? Super Saiyan Blue is still far beyond your scope. And then Vegeta begins to transform. However, on the next page, we see that both Goku and Vegeta can no longer use their transformations. Because they were standing on planet Namek, Moro has been siphoning their energy the entire time. Vegeta says, in shock, I can't turn Super Saiyan. Crazy. My first time seeing anything like this in Dragon Ball. This is crazy. Anyway, let's keep going. With that, Moro charges grabbing Vegeta's face and slamming him into a giant rock behind him. The blow sends Vegeta flying through mountains of rock. Moro, still smirking, says, You were already aware that my magic robs a planet's life energy, weren't you? Naturally, that included a healthy portion of your energy as well. As you were saying, I was hiding my true intent. You know, I want to quickly say one of the things I really enjoy about this fight so far is that it's been a fight, a battle, of not just powers, but also a battle of information. Goku and Vegeta would have approached this fight completely differently if they understood more about Moro. And you could tell since the battle begun, Moro has been using their ignorance against them. In the same way, Vegeta used Moro's ignorance about his transformations to extract more information from Moro. So that's pretty cool. I mean, this does happen in Dragon Ball, but it usually isn't as blatant or more interesting as it is here. Anyway, let's keep going. The fight continues with Moro using his magic 
to keep Vegeta flying through the rocks. Realizing that without Ki, Vegeta would probably die, Goku decides that he's no longer going to honor their 1v1 and attacks Moro with a flying kick. But Goku has also been getting his Ki stolen without realizing it. And because of that, Moro easily blocks Goku's attack. He then grabs Goku by the ankle and begins to repeatedly slam Goku into the ground. After that, he tosses Goku into the air and summons a lava attack from the planet that connects before Goku's body could fall to the ground. Darn it, Goku says. I'm totally drained. Moro then laughs and says, the longer we battle, the more feeble you grow. While, and at that moment, Vegeta, mustering his last bit of energy, leaps into the sky. With a look of resolve, he sends a gallic gun at Moro. But Moro just smiles, opens his mouth, and eats Vegeta's attack. He then finishes his sentence, still smiling, and says, while I grow even stronger. The story then flashes over to Beerus' planet, where Whis and Beerus are having a conversation. Beerus yawns, saying, so bored. But then he notices Whis is focusing on his staff. He says, what's up Whis? Whis then says, Planet Namek is exhibiting a sharp decline in energy levels, so I decided to take a peek. Is the planet about to die? Beerus says, excitingly. How exciting. I barely have to lift a finger here in Universe 7, since some planet buster will always come along and do my job for me, because I'm super busy, clearly. Didn't you just say you were bored? We said to Beerus with a flat look. Exactly. So I'm busy killing time. Beerus responds. Weiss then says, are you content to let the aforementioned matter play out? And Beerus responds, sure. That planet's got no food since the people there only drink water, so not interested. Weiss then says, very well. You know, I wish we would get a bit more of Beerus's motivation. I think it's past the point of saying Beerus is just lazy and it's more likely that he has something else going on that we haven't seen in the show yet. Like what is he killing time for? What is he ultimately hoping to accomplish by being such a bad god of destruction in Universe 7? Anyway, back to the fight. Goku and Vegeta are bloodied, but they're still standing and determined. Goku grabs Vegeta's arm and says, I feel bad about the Namikians, but we gotta get back to Miris and the Galactic Patrol. He tries to use instant transmission to get away. Then he says, what is this? I can't use instant teleportation. Not enough key. At the same time, Moro sends an attack their way. They both barely manage to leap away from the epicenter of the attack, but they're still caught up in the blast. The attack leaves a giant crater where Goku and Vegeta stood. And as the dust clears, we see that the two are laid out and can no longer move. Barely able to speak, Goku says, Are you still with me, Vegeta? Damn it, Vegeta says. As Moro hovers above them, Moro says, At last, your resistance ends. This was surprising, as being such as yourself did not exist in my era. The only one who stood in my way was the great Lord of Lords, who stole my abilities. Moro then quickly descends, slamming his knee into Goku's midsection and grabbing him by the neck. He continues by saying, however, I ought to mention that you two were never a threat to me. He then raises his other hand, pulling Vegeta to himself and grabbing Vegeta's neck. He continues by saying, in fact, I welcome your presence. Why? Because you will allow me to grow even more powerful. And with that, he begins to drain the last bit of key from Goku and Vegeta's body. A ball appears out of the area where Moro grabbed Goku and Vegeta as he opens his hand letting them fall to the ground. In the last panel of this page, Goku and Vegeta are completely lifeless as Moro consumes their ki. Moro raises his head to the sky. Incredible, he says. That energy from a mere pair of beings could restore my flesh to this extent. The power he stole from Goku and Vegeta allowed him to transform, or I should say revert closer to his old self. He no longer looks decrepit and old, his muscles are now well toned, although he still has a shorter white beard. Behind him, Cranberry walks up clapping. He says, whoa, great job, Moro. I was sure you could beat them all along. Moro just stares at him. He continues, oh right, um, I wasn't trying to run away before. Just thought I'll take the chance to collect the Dragon Balls. Moro looking at him says, surely you realize you cannot deceive me. Yeah, Cranberry responds. Well, how would you go about collecting them? Moro says to him. Um, well, I can pinpoint their villages with this scouter here. Each village is in charge of one ball. So once you've found the villages, the rest is easy. Moro then says, the nearby Namikians have begun to scatter. Cranberry says, oh, I forgot you don't need a scouter, Moro. Ignoring him, Moro continues, I sense a number of locations where they gather. Would those be the villages you speak of? 
Probably. Let us begin with the closest one then. Whatever you say, Cranberry responds, as they get back in their ship to start collecting the Dragon Balls. As they're taken off, pointing at Goku and Vegeta's unconscious body, Cranberry says, By the way, are those two good and dead? Moro says, Those drained of their energy will perish on their own in short order. Their lives no longer concern me, so let's proceed. But as Moro flies away, we see the Namikian elder and the young Namikian child, Eska, rush towards Goku and Vegeta's bodies. The elder says, they're still breathing. Quickly now, Eska. On Earth, Bulma is furious. It's been a week since Goku and Vegeta disappeared and she hasn't heard from them. So she found out from Hercule that the kidnappers had the galactic patrol sign on their uniforms. And so with Hercule, she's heading to her sister's place to try and contact Jacko. At the Galactic Patrol headquarters, an officer informs Miris that Majin Buu woke up. <laughs> he says that Majin Buu is ravaging through their food supplies. Miris heads off to deal with that while another agent informs Jacko that someone from Earth has been trying to reach him. Jacko gets on the line and realizes that he's talking to Boma, who is furious that Jacko made Goku and Vegeta joined the Galactic Patrol. Hercule asks about Majin Buu and Jacko lets him know that Buu just woke up from his nap. Jacko informs Boma on what's going on, but Boma is still furious, so Jacko pretends to be out of minutes and hangs up the call. Back on planet Namek, the Elder Guru and Eska manage to save Goku and Vegeta. They wake up and Vegeta asks, how long have I been out? The Elder Guru responds, You've slumbered for three full days. Vegeta and Goku are shocked, but then they ask about Moro. The Guru lets them know that Moro has attacked three villages in that time, and he's heading to a fourth as they speak. Vegeta says, you mean he's obtained three of the Dragon Balls? Indeed, said the Elder Guru. Three of our villages have failed to protect their Dragon Balls. He slaughtered them all. At that moment, they could sense Moro's key in another village. The Elder Guru says, not again, as Moro summons a wall of lava surrounding the entire village. He holds one of the Namikian with his magic and tosses him into the lava. How dare you, yelled the village elder. Your village is wreathed in flames, Moro says. There is no escape, so bring me your Dragon Ball. Back in their hideaway, Goku asked the Elder Guru, so he started killing Namikian. Damn it, I wish I could help, but I still can't use instant teleportation. The Namikian responds, there is hope. We've not been idle these three days. Looking shocked, Goku and Vegeta say, so you've come up with some sort of plan? We Namikians have assimilation as our last resort. Assimilation, Vegeta says. Oh, like what Piccolo did with Kami? Goku adds, The Elder Guru continues, The strongest warrior from every village has been combining and are headed to Moro's location. And we get a we get a pretty cool scene of three Namikians flying over the planet. The one in the middle raises his hands and they fuse mid-flight. The Elder Guru continues, When several dozen Namikians assimilate, the resultant warrior can defeat any evil that may threaten us. This is how our tribes has protected itself throughout the ages. Back in the village that Moro is currently attacking, the village elder Dare lets Moro know that you've had your way so far, but it ends now. Oh, Moro says, what do you mean? The savior of all Namikians will be upon us shortly. It's your fate to perish at his hands. And then we see even more Namikians merging into one, flying to Moro's location. The Elder Guru yells, Go savior of our dear planet. Embody the pride of every Namikian. Cranberry senses the power approach at Moro. As the village elder smiles, the fused warrior charges Moro from behind. And then, without turning around, Moro pierces the warrior through his midsection, killing him instantly, without ever looking at him. Was this your savior by chance? Moro said, smiling. Apologies. He was dead before I could even see his face. Moro then proceeds to kill all of the village residents. And after that, he realizes that he's able to start sensing the Dragon Balls themselves. He tells Cranberry the exact building he needs to search to find their fourth ball. Back on Earth, Piccolo and Dende can both sense that something is wrong. Dende says, Something terrible is happening on my home planet. Piccolo standing behind him says, You feel it too? Something is definitely happening and it's not good. Back to Planet Namek, now that Moro can sense the Dragon Balls, he very quickly tracks down two more, killing the Namikians tasked with defending them. This brings Moro's total to six out of seven balls, and while sitting on the ship with Cranberry, he senses the final one. He says, the final ball is near where we first landed. Goku and Vegeta, still recovering, sense that Moro is now flying directly towards them. Vegeta realizes that Moro is now somehow able 
to sense the Dragon Balls directly. The two begin to suit up and then Vegeta has a slightly touching moment with the Elder Guru. He says, old man, I need to know something. The Elder Guru says, what? Given that I slaughtered all those Namikians years ago, how do you feel about me? The Elder Guru responds, we don't forget these things so easily. Vegeta then says, so you hold a grudge then? Then the Elder Guru says, grudges and hatred can only bring about further conflict. The Namikian people are not so foolish as to indulge in such things. Vegeta then says, I see. The Guru continues, we only wish to preserve peace in our home world nothing more. Vegeta then walks out to meet Goku, both prepared to face Moro. Vegeta says to Goku, Kakarot, if you survive, make restoring this planet to how it once was your top priority. Goku says, okay, but that said, it'll take a miracle for either one of us to walk away from this alive. But what other option is there? I wonder if Goku now has enough key to instant transmission away. Just then, Moro senses that Goku and Vegeta are still alive. He says, those two, they're alive. They were hiding this whole time, huh? Those galactic patrol cowards, this time they will perish by my hands. He's caught our scent, Vegeta says, and he's here. Goku says with a nervous smile. The two power up with whatever little key they have and charge towards Moro's ship. They're coming, Cranberry says. But before Goku and Vegeta could clash with the ship, Midair, a second ship shows up. It's Miris with the Galactic Patrol. He stands outside of their ship and shoots the engines off of Moro's ship. This sends it plummeting to the ground, but Moro leaps out of the cockpit to fly above Miris, raining key blasts down on him. Miris, using his rocket boots, is able to dodge all of Moro's attacks. He then speed blitzes Moro in the air, appearing slightly above him, and shoots him with a web of sticky goo designed to suppress Moro's movement. Miris then drags Moro down to the ground as he struggles to escape the web. He says to Moro, we developed this device just for pinning you down. You won't tear it apart that easily. At the same time, Goku and Vegeta land behind Miris. Goku, Vegeta, he says, how good to see you both unharmed. Cranberry looking on from Moro's crash ship is shocked. He says, they caught him. Goku asks Miris, you gonna take him back to prison like that? Miris responds, no. I'm afraid this isn't strong enough to hold him for long. It's just a temporary fix to keep him in place until we've found a solution. Now get him out here, he yells to his ship. Who's him? Goku says to himself. The ship's back door opens and Jackal pushes Majin Buu out. They both fall to the surface of new planet Namek. Buu springs up and right away he recognizes Moro. He says, I remember, you're the bad guy I caught way back. Moro shocked says, could you really be the Lord of Lords? Things are about to get interesting, guys. Boo, furious, literal steam coming out of his head, says, you killed so many of my friends. Moro, also furious, staring at Boo, begins to power up and breaks Miris' capture device. Moro says to Boo, the great Lord of Lords, I have not forgotten the debt I owe you. Boo responds, and I didn't forget what you did. You don't get to pick on everyone anymore. Boo also powers up. Miris, looking at the two from the side, says, amazing. There's a moment of them staring each other down, but then Boo is the first to act, charging at Moro. Moro attempts to use a lava wall to protect himself, but Boo flies right through it, delivering a powerful right-handed punch. Goku and Vegeta off to the side are shocked that the flames didn't phase Majin Buu. It obviously even caught Moro off guard. Moro flies back for some distance, but then centers himself and attack Buu, piercing his arm straight through Majin Buu's core. But then Buu just looks at him and grins. Moro leaps back as the hole in Majin Buu's stomach repairs itself. Buu quickly follows up with a barrage of key blasts. He smiles as his attacks create a dust cloud around Moro. But as the dust clears, we see that Moro is preparing another lava ball attack, pulling the energy of New Planet Namek. He tosses it at Majin Buu, but Buu simply kicks it straight into the sky. Buu follows up with a series of flips that stop right above Moro and then punched Moro, setting him flying back down to the ground. Off to the side, Goku is cheering him on. Vegeta says, have you noticed Kakarot? Buu's energy levels aren't dropping. Moro's energy absorption must not work on him. Goku says, whoa, you're right. Buu can do it. A bit beaten up. Moro says to Buu, you, how did you come by such abilities? And Buu simply smiles in response. The fight between Buu and Moro continues with Buu having a clear upper hand, literally. At one point, he creates sets of extra hands to pin Moro to the ground. Goku and Vegeta note that not only is Moro's draining magic not working against Buu, but Buu is also much stronger than he was before. Mira says that maybe unlocking those memories somehow unleashed 
Boo's potential. Anyway, while Moro is pinned to the ground moments before he's defeated by Majin Buu, the sky on New Planet Namek suddenly goes dark. Goku and Vegeta recognize what's happening right away. Someone has summoned Purunga, the dragon of New Planet Namek. On the next panel, we see that it's Cranberry. He's controlling Eska. He's killed the Elder Namekian and he's using Eska to translate to the dragon so he can make his wish. For his first wish, he wishes for Purunga to heal him back to full health. But before he can make his second wish, Moro contacts him telepathically and tells him quickly, wish for me to regain my full magical power. Cranberry hesitates for a second, obviously thinking about betraying Moro, but then he makes the wish. He wishes for Moro to regain his full power. And in that moment, while pinned, Moro experienced a significant boost in power. He is able to break Majin Buu's restraint and fly straight to where Cranberry is. Before Cranberry can make his third wish, Moro then pierces his hand through him and kills his own partner. Moro then makes the final wish with Purunga. And before we can see what the wish is, the Dragon Balls dissipate, meaning that Purunga was able to complete all three wishes. Goku and Vegeta arrive to where Moro is and ask him, what did you wish for? Moro just smiles and says, you'll know soon enough. As Majin Buu, Miris, and the others catch up, Moro announces, I have no more need to battle you people. Farewell. Moro flies away as Majin Buu arrives, and Buu lets everyone know that Moro's magical powers are different from pure strength. Because his magical powers are back, he'll try to eat the whole planet. Buu also takes a moment to heal Eska, but then says that there's nothing he can do for the Elder Guru. In that moment, the planet begins to shake and they all realize that Moro is going to attempt to devour new planet Namek. Boo pats Goku and Vegeta on the shoulder, healing them instantly. And then his face and clothes change to match the great Lord of Lords. Majin Buu, aka the Dayo Kaioshin himself, then says, A pleasure to meet you all. Until Moro's defeated, I'll be taking Boo's place. There's still time, but we all have to confront him before he devours the planet. Makes sense, Goku says. Then, the fully powered Goku Vegeta and the Daikaiyo Shin teleport to where they can sense Moro. When they arrive, they see Moro draining the planet's energy, creating what looks like a giant spirit bomb. They attack immediately, but then realize that that wasn't Moro's real body. Moro left an illusion to distract them while he did his absorption from outside the planet's atmosphere. Goku wanted to risk it all and attack Moro anyway, but Vegeta reminds him that Saiyans cannot survive in the vacuum of space. Because of that, the Daiokaiyo Shin says he'll go fight Moro alone. In this fight, however, it's obvious that Moro has gotten a lot stronger, and even though the Daiokaiyo Shin could kind of hold his own, Moro is slowly overpowering him. There's an interesting moment that has a lot of implications where the Daiokaiyo Shin attempts to seal Moro's magic again, but he couldn't. Moro realized that he was bluffing. He no longer had his god powers. And then Miris explains that the reason for that is because when the Daiokaiyo Shin was absorbed by Majin Buu and then Majin Buu split into two, Evil Buu and Good Buu, Good Buu kept the Daiokaiyo Shin's physical appearance while Evil Buu got his god key. This is really interesting stuff for the Dragon Ball universe. I actually did a video about this some while back because it had some big implications for Oob because remember Oob is a reincarnation of Evil Buu. So that means he was born with god key and what do you call someone born with god key? Anyway, I'll, I'll actually leave a link to that video if I remember for you to check it out below. But, but let's continue. After realizing that the Daiokai Shin no longer has his god key, Moro gets a lot more confident and begins to dominate the fight. Goku and Vegeta let Miris know that they are still more powerful than Moro, and if they could somehow get Moro back to the planet's surface, they'll be able to defeat him. Because of that, Miris decides to leave the ship and assist the great Lord of Lords in his fight. Miris again fights in a very unconventional way and it feels like he's punching way above his weight class, but eventually he's successful. He distracts Moro long enough for the Daikai Shin to grab him and instantly teleport back to the surface of Planet Namek. Goku and Vegeta show up ready to take Moro on in a fair fight and then Moro reminds them that they seem to have forgotten something very important. He says, the third wish. In the next chapter, we find out exactly what that third wish was. The chapter starts with a close up of the Galactic Patrol headquarters. The officers in charge of monitoring the prison cells 
realize that the barriers keeping the cellmates in their cells are all starting to fail. In an instant, all of the prisoners being kept imprisoned by the Galactic Patrol are free. One of the prisoners smiled to himself saying, you really pulled it off Lord Morrow, time to run. Shortly after, that prisoner is approached by his henchmen. We find out that his name is Sangambo, and they all team up as they prepare to overpower the prison guards. Sangambo quickly takes control of the escaped prisoners, and while holding a Galactic Patrol officer at gunpoint, or I guess I should say laser point, he demands to know where his spaceship is, which is apparently the fastest spaceship in the universe. You'll see why. Even the Macarini siblings that Miris captured earlier decide that they're going to team up with the escapees. Anyway, the story then flashes back over to New Planet Namek where Miris is receiving a message on his ship about what's going on back at the Galactic Patrol prison. After hearing the message, Eska, the Namekian child, gets his memory jogged and he says, I'm remembering Moro's wish, the final one. And then Moro himself announces, yes, for that final wish I demanded that every prisoner in the Galactic prison Go free. Here they come, Moro says. In that moment, Sagambo's ship appears in the skies of New Planet Namek and fires on Goku, Vegeta, and the Daya Kaioshin. The three manage to leap out of the way, but it's a massive attack from a ship. Moro is then instantly on top of the ship, whereas Sangambo kneels to him. Moro says, you brought me a small army, I see. Well done. As promised, I will share my power with you. The entire ship begins to glow as the doors around the ship open and the prisoners begin to leap out. So this is why he seems so confident, Vegeta says. Goku responds by saying, we had no idea he'd be bringing friends. Moro, standing on top of his ship with his arms folded, says, have at them, convicts. I do want to point out something that is interesting about Moro. His beard, the length of his beard, sort of represents how much power he's currently holding in his body. So for example, in earlier panels, you'll notice his beard is much shorter, but now that he shared some of his power with the prisoners, the center of his beard has grown again. Anyway, I just thought that was a little interesting tidbit. Let's keep going. Goku and Vegeta power up and alongside the Daiokai Shin, they begin to defeat the prisoners. The prisoners are shocked by how strong Goku and Vegeta are, but Sangambo lets them know that they're not allowed to run unless they want to head back to prison. Prison, they need to obey Lord Moro's commands. In the middle of their fight, Goku and Vegeta instantly drop out of Super Saiyan Blue back into Super Saiyan God. They look up to realize that Moro is again draining their key. Goku charges at Moro, but then he's intercepted by Sangambo. Before they could even clash, however, Goku is forced back into Super Saiyan 3, and the surprise of it all gives Sangambo the upper hand. He punches Goku sending him flying back to the surface of New Planet Namek. Vegeta yells at Goku, telling him to pick himself up, but then Vegeta is assaulted by a group of prisoners. Even the Daikai Shin is beginning to get overpowered, with both Goku and Vegeta noticing that his battle with Moro earlier is taking a toll on him. The two are able to power up back into Super Saiyan, but at this point, they're barely holding their own against the souped up prisoners. Goku yells to Moro, who is still selectively absorbing their key. Hey Moro, what are you really after? What's the point of all this? Moro says back, to create an ideal galaxy where I'm free to consume planets as I wish. Gathering these allies is a small step towards that end. Vegeta says, do you hold a grudge against the Galactic Patrol then? Moro smiles and says, I wonder. What I can say is, I detest the sort of peace you people seek to preserve on this planet and others. All who should strive for such nonsense should be eradicated. With that, Goku and Vegeta fall back into base form. Vegeta says, and now we can't even go Super Saiyan. Damn it. How many times will we fall for his tricks? Goku and Vegeta are beginning to slowly get overpowered again. Miris, noticing this from the ship, tells Jacko that they have to help their allies. We see an interesting moment where Moro uses the energy he's currently absorbing to further enhance the prisoners fighting Goku and Vegeta. Vegeta says, blast. These fools aren't getting any weaker. Moro must only be absorbing energy from us. So yeah, not only is Moro selectively choosing where the energy comes from, he's also directing it to his allies, which is pretty crazy. I do want to mention here that one thing that I didn't fully appreciate in my first read through of this arc was the fact that Goku and Vegeta are still more powerful than Moro at this point, which is important to me. I hate that at the beginning of an arc, it almost always feels like Goku and Vegeta and the other Z warriors are depowered to match the current arc's villain. That's not what happened here with Moro. They're still stronger than Moro, but Moro uses their strength against them by absorbing it, using it for himself or his allies. Anyway, 
Miris and Jacko show up and begin to blast a few of the prisoners with their laser guns. Miris lets them know that as things are, they have no chance of defeating Moro currently. They need to retreat. Sangambo notices Miris' ship in the sky and points his laser gun at it. But Miris, on the ground, spots what's going on and shoots Sangambo's laser gun out of his hand. Even Sangambo is shocked by this. He says, what the heck, at this range? Yeah, something's definitely going on with Miris, and we're going to find out what that is soon. Anyway, Goku yells, I hear you, Miris, so grab my hand. We'll escape with instant teleportation. Miris yells at the Daiokai Shin, telling him to use his own instant teleportation to warp to the Galactic Patrol headquarters. The Daiokai Shin grabs Eska and says, very well, we'll meet you there. Preparing to teleport away, Jacko and Miris grab Goku. Goku reaches for Vegeta, but Vegeta is upset. Goku says to him, what's the hold up Vegeta? If he absorbs any more energy, I won't be able to use instant teleportation again. Vegeta is upset and says, stupid magic spells, stupid god power, forget instant teleportation. We Saiyans pride ourselves in our physical might. A warrior race has no need for fancy parlor tricks. And yet, I'm reduced to this. Upset now because this isn't a time for Vegeta to let his pride take over. Goku says, let's go. You want to die here or something? Vegeta slaps his hand away and says, go ahead Kakarot. This is where we part ways. He then flies toward Mirish's ship in the sky. Vegeta, Goku yelled, but there's no more time. They're leapt on by a group of prisoners. So Goku instantly teleports away. The group of prisoners then turn and attempt to target the ship that Vegeta is on, but the ship captain activates some sort of warp drive and they escape as well. Vegeta then lets the ship captain know that they're not going back to the Galactic Patrol headquarters. They're going to go where he wants to go. The officer says, and exactly where is that? And Vegeta responds, we're going to Planet Yardrat. Now that the Galactic Patrol has completely pulled out of New Planet Namek, Moro decides that he is going to drain the planet of all its life force. And he does exactly that, achieving his second transformation. In this form, his beard is completely gone, and he says his physical recovery is essentially complete. He then decides to split up the convicts, his own little army, to go scout for more planets for him to devour. Back in the Galactic Patrol headquarters, Boo goes back to sleep, while Goku decides that he finally needs to test Miris, and Miris agrees. Goku and Miris go into a training room that was built to handle large-scale combat, and Goku realizes while cycling through his transformations that he can't hit Miris. Goku goes all the way up to Super Saiyan God, but with that, the training room begins to break down. So Goku decides that that's enough of a demonstration. After that, he asks Miris, would you be willing to train me? And Miris agrees. The next couple chapters are the training arc within the Moro arc. Vegeta arrives on planet Yardrat and meets the person who taught Goku instant teleportation. He eventually decides to take Vegeta on as a pupil as well, and Vegeta proves to be more of a genius than Goku was. At the same time, Goku is training with Miris in a room very similar to the hyperbolic time chamber. While this is happening, however, the Macarini siblings, who are now working on the Moro, remember Goku and Vegeta mentioned in Earth as they were being apprehended by Miris. They decide that they were going to go and take over Earth, rob it of its resources, and then perhaps report it to Moro so Moro can absorb the planet after they've already stolen Earth's valuables. But when they arrive on Earth, they are greeted by Piccolo, who pretty easily defeats them. Piccolo, after realizing that the Macarini siblings weren't that big of a threat, gives them a chance to board their ship and fly away. But as they were leaving, Dinde informs Piccolo that the Macarini siblings do work for Moro, and Piccolo shoots their ship down out of the sky. However, he was a little too late. They had already contacted Moro to put planet Earth on his radar as a planet he should devour. Moro decides to instead send a stronger scouting party to assess the planet. And with that, the three strongest henchmen right below Sangambo start making their way to Earth. The name of one of those henchmen is 7-3. He is an advanced android from another planet and he has the ability to absorb the abilities of any creature he grabs by the neck. On their way to Earth, the three henchmen stop at a planet where 7-3 absorbs the abilities of a species that can make portals to other places in the universe. He then uses it to make a portal directly to Earth, catching Piccolo and Krillin off guard. 
Right away, 7-3 senses Piccolo's strength, grabs his neck, and copies his abilities. The fight is even for a while until Piccolo realizes that because 7-3 is an android, he never runs out of stamina, but Piccolo himself will slowly run out of energy during the fight. And that's what happens. Eventually, 7-3 starts to push Piccolo back. This is until Gohan shows up. It's a difficult fight, but Gohan ultimately proves to be much stronger than 7-3, and now that they are aware of his ability, Gohan is very careful to not let 7-3 touch his neck. Gohan is on the verge of delivering the final blow when they learn that 7-3 can switch into the stored abilities of beings that he's previously copied, and one of those beings is Moro himself. He switches into Moro and begins to use the same tactic Moro used on New Planet Namek against Goku and Vegeta, absorbing the key of the Z-Warriors, making them weak enough for the other two henchmen to easily dominate the fight. During this fight, Krillin lets it slip that Goku and Vegeta are currently off-planet training. Back on their ship, Moro and Sangambo are observing the fight and this is the first time Moro makes the connection that Goku and Vegeta are from planet Earth. Moro decides to pull his henchmen back from the planet, his logic being that if Goku and Vegeta show up even stronger, he'll be able to absorb them and get even more energy than just devouring the planet itself. 7-3 and the others withdraw from Earth, leaving the Z-Warriors defeated. Before they leave, they let them know that Moro will arrive in two months. This chapter ends with a big bombshell because although Beerus didn't want to get involved, Whis has been paying attention to the situation. He approaches the Grand Priest wanting to talk about Miris potentially violating the laws of the angels. So this was a big deal. Here we find out for the first time that Miris is secretly an angel. More specifically, Miris is an angel trainee of the Grand Priest. The Grand Priest says he was sent to Universe 7 so that he might learn the way of things and broaden his perspective. But because of Miris's current intention behind training Goku, which is he wants Goku to defeat Moro, Miris is on the cusp of violating angelic law. That law is they must remain impartial at all times. If that law is broken, then the angel in question, in this case Miris, will simply be erased. Whis asked the Grand Priest if he might allow him, Whis, to deal with Miris before it gets to that. And surprisingly, the Grand Priest agrees. He says, troublemaker or not, I do not wish to lose an angel. So because of that, just as the training between Goku and Miris is about to hit its climax, the two are about to clash at full strength when Whis appears and lets Miris know that what he's doing is not allowed. Miris apologizes to Goku for lying and says, Goku, I'm sorry I couldn't see this through with you, but I have faith you will defeat Moro. Goku says, sure, I'll figure something out. And with that, Whis and Miris depart. Right before Goku realizes that, he doesn't know how to pilot the Galactic Patrol ship to get back to Earth. In the next chapter, we get right into it. The Galactic Patrol is sending its forces to Earth to help defend against Moro's attack. We see what's now a pretty iconic picture of all the Z-Warriors excluding Goku and Vegeta with the Galactic Patrol symbol on their battle attire standing in front of the Galactic Patrol forces. It's a pretty cool picture. No matter what, Earth is always ready for the smoke. Piccolo says, the time has finally come. It won't be long now. Boo arrives on Earth, still asleep from his battle on New Planet Namek. But in that moment, Mr. Popo points to the sky, pointing out the arrival of Moro and his minions. Moro's ship hovers above Earth and sends out a series of satellite ships to different parts of the globe with the goal of collecting all the valuable things on Earth before Moro devours the planet. Because of this, the Z-Warriors decide that they're going to split up to defend all the areas currently under attack. Yamcha goes off by himself while Tien and Chao Su team up. So does Master Roshi and Krillin. Each party of Z-Warriors has a set of Galactic Patrol officers in their ships following them for assistance, which is pretty cool. Krillin and Master Roshi are the first to engage. Krillin actually ends up fighting the same high-level henchmen that fought alongside 7-3 in the earlier attack, while Master Roshi decides that he wants to fight the three young alien females that is with 
the henchmen. Gohan and Piccolo are approached by the second henchman when suddenly they feel a presence behind them grabbing them at the neck. 7-3, since leaving them, has copied the power of an invisible race. Because of this, he was able to sneak up behind Gohan and Piccolo, meaning that he will start this fight with both of their powers already copied. I want to add a bit of context to 7-3's power because his ability is unique in the Dragon Ball landscape, so much so that he's built a bit of a fan base. Also, this will become relevant later on in the story. Anyway, 7-3 copies all the powers and abilities of another entity for half an hour by touching the back of their neck. To get around the half an hour time limit, he is able to create a complete backup of someone's abilities and raw power. If he decides to use that power, it'll still be a 30 minute time limit, but he can essentially store the backup indefinitely. So it's a pretty interesting concept in Dragon Ball, especially for an android, but let's continue. The fight starts with 7-3 sending a special beam cannon at Gohan and Piccolo. Gohan hops in front of Piccolo and creates a shield with his key. I've never seen Gohan use this technique before, by the way. Behind him, Piccolo begins to charge his own special beam cannon, and at the same time, Gohan pushes his shield back towards 7-3 while Piccolo fires his special beam cannon, hitting the shield from the opposite side. This amplifies Piccolo's attack and catches 7-3 off guard, destroying the left Left half of his body. 7-3 uses Piccolo's regeneration ability to regrow his limb, but the opening of this fight was clearly a victory for Gohan and Piccolo. Gohan says, we were totally ready for him to copy our abilities. Because Gohan is stronger than Piccolo, 7-3 then switches his profile into Gohan and begins a barrage of attacks. Piccolo sends his own barrage towards 7-3, while Gohan begins to ride Piccolo's key blast to get closer to the enemy and deliver a powerful left hook. Gohan says, we'll never lose to some copycat. The idea being, even though 7-3 has their abilities and power, he doesn't have their years of training together, and so their combination moves are powerful enough to handle the android. Around the planet, everyone else is doing pretty well in their solo fights. Even Yamcha has a moment where he reminds everyone that he's actually one of the three strongest earthlings around. Gohan and Piccolo attempt to finish off 7-3 quickly with a combination key blast and although the attack did significant damage, it wasn't enough to put him down for good. Gohan yells, if we don't finish him off, he'll resort to using Moro's power again and 7-3 attempts to do just that. However, in that instant, another pair of warriors show up. It's the androids of Earth, Android 17 and 18. The idea is that because androids don't have key, 7-3 will not be able to absorb their energy and so they can fight on equal ground. I mean, I just want to say this real quick. If the androids had went to New Planet Namek instead of Goku and Vegeta, this arc would have been one or two chapters long. Anyway, let's keep going. Seeing all this from his ship, Moro is disappointed in his crew and his army. He says, pathetic. These useless fools couldn't even meet my low expectations of them. Sangambo says, Apologies, Lord Moro. It seems like a whole bunch of tough fighters gathered on Earth for some reason. No matter, Moro says. There would be no meaning in coming all this way otherwise. Now, who will be the first on my menu? On Planet Yardrat, Vegeta's powers have evolved enough to sense that the fighting has already started on Earth. Vegeta says there's no point for him to rush to join the fight until he's mastered his technique. He can even sense that Moro himself hasn't joined the battle yet. There's still time, he says. Meanwhile, Goku is lost. He's on a random asteroid looking planet asking random aliens for directions on how to get to Earth. We also get a rare treat at the end of this chapter where one of Frieza's men informs him about the criminals that escaped from the Galactic Patrol ravaging the planet that was Frieza's next target. Frieza however decides that he will prefer to avoid meaningless conflict and simply move on to the next planet. He says, nothing good can come from mixing with criminals, which is hilarious. In the next chapter, the Z warriors are able to clean up most of their fights. Master Roshi, however, being a pervert, is having a hard time with his three female opponents. So he decides that in order to overcome his limitations, he'll wear a blindfold because now that he can't see the women, he can actually fight back. The women, however, decide to fuse, and as a three-way fusion, they become a much more significant threat. At the same time, Moro decides to make his move. Along with Sangambo, he descends to the surface of planet Earth. 
His first action was to save 7-3. He tells one of his henchmen that there will come a time when he'll need 7-3's powers again, so help him to recover. Sangambo decides that to make up for his men being failures, he would like to fight in Moro's stead. And Moro agrees. Moro says, here's another gift for you. He gives Sangambo another boost in power and he charges at the Z-Warriors. The souped up Sangambo proves to be a match for Android 17, Android 18, Piccolo and Gohan combined. At the same time, Tien, Chaosu and Yamcha run into a prisoner who is much stronger than the others they've been fighting so far. In addition to that, the female fusion has been dominating Master Roshi and Krillin to the point that they have to hide behind a rock. However, the narrator lets us know that far away in space, Goku is on his way. Goku is barely able to feel the key down on Earth. He says because their key were shrinking, it's too hard for him to get a solid hold and use instant teleportation, but almost as if he could read Goku's thoughts, Krillin jumps on top of a small hill and begins to power up. Goku says, I know that key. It's Krillin. I found it. Earth. As the female fusion charges Krillin to deliver a final blow, Goku's right leg taps down in front of him. Goku, he says. Goku turns around with a smile and says, sorry, I've got a habit of showing up late, Krillin. The next chapter is Goku just going to work. He starts by pretty much instantly defeating the female fusion, forcing them to defuse with very little effort. He then instantly teleports to where Tien Chao Su and Yamcha are fighting and one shots their opponent. At the epicenter of Moro's invasion, Sangambo is still dominating Krillin, Gohan, and the androids. He takes a combination attack from Krillin and Gohan at point blank and simply walks through it. But then, out of nowhere, he receives a kick that sends him flying. He says, who's there? Who kicked me? Even Piccolo and Gohan have no idea what's going on. Piccolo says, someone sent him flying all on their own. And then Sangambo begins to receive a series of attacks, punches, kicks, powerful enough to send him to the floor gasping for air while still not being able to perceive his opponent. Barely standing, he says, how? How is this happening? And then Gohan gets excited. Gohan says, it's dad. He's here at last. Piccolo says, huh? I can't see or sense his key. And then Jacko, who's standing off to the side, says that Goku is fighting while zipping around at a super duper hyper speed. Piccolo's surprised that Jacko can see him. And Jacko says, yeah, my vision is actually one of my strong suits which makes sense because Jacko has eyes like a bug. Piccolo then says, well, why can't we sense Goku's key? Gohan says, maybe he's moving too fast for us to lock onto it. To himself, Piccolo says, what new heights has he really reached? Even Moro is having a hard time perceiving Goku, but still he smiles. He says, one of them is finally here. The one who employed instant teleportation on Namek. Yes. Go ahead and reveal yourself, son Goku, was it? Moro says, and with that, Goku grabs the ankle of Sangambo and tosses him towards Moro. Goku then lands behind Moro and says, I was hoping to go right ahead and beat you too. Moro turns around smiling, looking at him, while Goku continues. I guess it won't be that simple. Still smiling, Moro turns to him and says, You've grown far stronger. Goku says, Yep, I'm not the same guy I was when we first met. And then Moro says, Is that so? Glad to hear it. At the same time, even though he's badly injured, Sangambo stands up. Furious. Goku is surprised by this. He says he's still up and running. Sangambo yells to Moro, Lord Moro, I can still fight for you. You heard him, Moro said to Goku, pointing at Sangambo. Well, would you prefer to fight me or him? Goku responds, Stick around, Moro, because after him, you're next. Goku then proceeds to beat the living crap out of Sangambo. Over and over, Goku knocks him down to a point where he shouldn't be able to move, but he keeps getting up. After a while, Goku realizes it's because Moro is feeding him energy beyond his limits. Knowing how this will end, Goku tells Moro to stop, but Moro just keeps going until eventually something within Sangambo snaps and he falls to the ground, dead. Moro smirks and says, he couldn't even withstand a smidgen of my energy. How pathetic. Goku is furious at Moro. He says, wasn't he your friend? My friend? Moro says, I have no friends. Those were my soldiers. They may be gone, but I can always collect more. Goku says, you're a total scumbag. Moro responds with a smile, think whatever you like. Goku then says, fine, I'm ready to show you the power I gain to beat you. Goku powers down and then instantly transforms into Ultra Instinct Sign. Right away, Moro's entire demeanor changes. He says, 
this is no mortal ability. Goku responds with, that's right, the initial stage of the technique of the gods, Ultra Instinct Sign. Ultra Instinct Sign begins to dominate Moro. Goku is even able to negate Moro's energy absorption by moving too fast for him to track. But then, Moro reveals that weakening his opponents and strengthening himself are just fortunate side effects of him consuming energy. It's not his primary goal. He says his goal is to fill his stomach. He tells Goku, as such, I will happily devour your energy after you're defeated. You thought this was all I could muster, you fool? And then Moro begins to power up. Piccolo, Gohan, and Jacko are surprised to learn that Moro was not fighting at full strength. Moro says, I've consumed countless planets since our previous encounter, all of which have filled me with enough power to transcend the very gods. I want to stop right here for a second. This is something that's been bothering me since the Tournament of Power, and I just got to say it. I got to get it out. During the Tournament of Power, Shin said that there were only 28 planets in Universe 7 with mortal life. Now Moro is saying that he's consumed countless planets, and Frieza has been ravaging planets ever since the Tournament of Power ended too. So what's going on here? Did Shin just get it wrong? Did he just lie? Is Moro absorbing planets that don't necessarily have life on them, but the planet itself has life energy because 28 planets is not countless if somebody knows the answer to this please let me know in the comments because this is something that's been bothering me this entire arc anyway let's keep going the powered up moro sends a key blast at goku goku bats it away but it was just a distraction moro is fast enough now to speed blitz goku getting behind him and putting him in a bear hug. Moro says, I now understand why you didn't employ this form during the fight with Sangambo. He then does this attack that is almost like striking Goku with lightning. He continues by saying, it's because you can't maintain it for long. Then he grabs Goku by the back of his head and tosses him towards a large rock. But Goku stands up smiling. He says, I should have realized you've already figured out my weakness. But still, if you were just stalling for time, that means you don't think you can beat me when I'm at full power. So if I can just keep hitting you with all I've got, I can win this. And then Goku transforms back into Ultra Instinct Sign. Moro smiles and says, so you still had some power left. Good, now I'm intrigued. Off on Beerus's planet, Whis and Miris are watching the fight. Talking about Goku, Whis asks Miris, so was he only able to achieve the sign level? Miris says, yes, he never managed to activate the true Ultra Instinct form. Whis responds by saying, I see. That doesn't bode well. Sign serves as a gateway to Ultra Instinct, but it isn't stable. Maintaining that instability consumes an enormous amount of stamina. Mira says, I'm aware of this. This battle hinges on Son Goku's ability to manage that energy drain while keeping up Sign as long as possible. And then, almost as if he can hear him, Goku says, Sorry Miris, but a stamina balancing act during battle just isn't my style. Goku and Moro then have a clash of key where Goku actually comes out on top. He pushes Moro back and then launches an assault. For some time, Goku controls the fight until Moro grabs his ankle and slams him into the ground. The fight then continues with the two being relatively evenly matched until Moro says to Goku with a smile, if this is truly the extent of your power, then I will not fall to you. On his planet, Whis can see that Goku is quickly running out of stamina. He says, Saiyans are known to exhibit untold power when their backs are against the wall, especially Goku. He looks to the sky and says, and Vegeta. Right then, we flash over to Vegeta on Yardrat. Vegeta has just managed to complete his new technique. He smiles and says, Earth is still in one piece. It seems like I'll make it in time. He then tells his sensei to transport him to Earth, but his sensei lets him know, that they are forbidden to use instant teleportation to travel off planet. So if Vegeta wants to make it to Earth in time, he would have to perform the instant transmission technique himself. Back on Earth, Goku continues his assault against Moro, but he is quickly running out of stamina, meaning Moro is now able to counterattack. Whis is still monitoring Goku, and he says, sadly, it doesn't look like we'll be witnessing any miracles today. At that moment, Beerus says to Whis, hey Whis, I'm starving. I want to chow down on something tasty. Whis smiles and says, very well. Miris is frustrated that Whis and Beerus are so casual about this. He says, at this rate, the Earth and so many other planets, Dale. And then Whis cuts him off saying, Miris, the birth and death of a planet is simply a part of the great and long cycle of the universe. Excessive meddling on our part 
would affect the natural flow of these matters, which is not necessarily a good thing. What's more, only the likes of Lord Beerus and the Lord of Lords can decide such things. It's not for us angels to intervene. Never forget that. Let me just jump in here for a second because my only beef with what Weiss is saying is that in Universe 7, they no longer have a great Lord of Lords, which is essentially the God of creation. He was absorbed by Majin Buu. And Shin isn't effective in that position. Nor do they have an effective God of Destruction because Beerus cares more about food than he cares about mortal life. But just keep in mind that Beerus, the Great Lord of Lords, and even the angels, even Whis, they all share the same goal. And that goal is supposed to be to raise the mortal level, is what they call it, of Universe 7. I mean, just bear with me for a few more seconds because I want to give you an analogy here. Imagine Universe 7 is a garden and the mortals would be the food it produces while the mortal level would be how fertile the ground, the dirt is to produce the food. The job of the great Lord of Lords is like the farmer or more specifically the seeder, the person who plants the seeds for the food, while the job of Beerus will be the weed killer. Weiss's job is to essentially advise the weed killer so he doesn't get out of control. In Universe 7, there is no farmer and the weed killer doesn't care about the weeds. And yet, Weiss's position is this is natural for the garden and they shouldn't get involved. Yeah, so there's obviously more context to the actions of the angels and the gods, context that we haven't gotten yet in the story. But without that context, their actions here in this arc make no sense. Let me know what you guys think about that though. Anyway, let's keep going. Mirus accepts Whis's words and the story goes back to Earth when Moro is starting to gain the upper hand on Goku. Moro lands a powerful kick to Goku's midsection, stomping him into the ground. Off to the side, Gohan notices that Goku has lost his Ultra Instinct aura. Smugly, Moro says, that's quite enough fun for now. Yes, it's about time to consume your energy. With his foot on Goku's chest, Moro stands above him and begins the absorption, but the two androids, Android 17 and 18, attack Moro from behind, saving Goku. Moro flips away while we jump over to planet Yardrat. Vegeta is struggling to perform instant teleportation. This isn't the technique he's been working on the entire time. Vegeta is essentially trying to learn in minutes, something that took Goku months to accomplish. Back on Earth, the androids continue their attack on Moro but they quickly realize that they are no match for him. At the same time on planet Yardrat, Vegeta says, I have a feeling I can pull this off. Vegeta then closes his eyes and performs instant transmission for the first time. His master looking to the cloud says, that Vegeta must be some kind of prodigy. He then says his achievements are product of all his training. In that sense, he may be a prodigy, yes one born of hard work. Back on Earth, Goku is struggling to stand up to help the androids when suddenly Vegeta appears in front of him. Vegeta looks back and says, hello Kakarot, hype moment. Anyway, Vegeta continues, well don't you look pathetic. What, did Ultra Instinct prove to be useless? Goku says, did you just use instant teleportation? Vegeta responds, worry not. I have no intention of pilfering your signature move. I likely wouldn't be able to pull it off again and won't be learning it after this. Besides, I've learned a far superior technique of my own. Then he yells, hey, 17, 18, that's enough, my turn. That one's mine. Moro smirks and says, Vegeta, you finally arrived. Vegeta responds, I s <laughs> hold on. Vegeta says, I see that our time apart hasn't done anything to fix that joke you call a face, Moro. Do you enjoy tormenting the weak? Moro responds, the weak. You aren't wrong. While you worms were hiding, I may have gone and become too powerful, and I've grown wary of planets that cannot provide fighters to match me. Vegeta, still smiling, responds, oh, no cause for concern there. He then powers up right away into Super Saiyan Blue and says, you want someone stronger than you? You found him. Vegeta then charges at Moro. His first few punches connect, pushing Moro backwards. But off to the side, both Gohan and Piccolo mention that even though Vegeta has gotten more powerful, Moro is on a different level. Moro catches Vegeta's fist and says, submit Vegeta. He then kicks him and sends him flying. Then he begins a short monologue. He says, I do commend you for elevating your power to such heights. You'll make one of my finest meals yet. Vegeta stands up with a resolved look in his eyes and charges at Moro again. Off to the side, Piccolo notes that Vegeta has never been one to misread 
an opponent's strength. He says something is up. Moro attempts to hit Vegeta with a finishing blow when Vegeta dodges and counter strikes Moro to the side of his face. Moro then grabs Vegeta and slams him into the ground. But Vegeta simply stands up and continues his assault. Now, however, Vegeta's attacks seem to be connecting with more and more force. One of Vegeta's kicks lands on the side of Moro's body and we see Moro's key flying off. Vegeta flips away and in that moment, Goku says to him, Vegeta, that new move of yours. And Vegeta responds, forced spirit fission. The fight continues and off to the side, Gohan says, more of his attacks are landed. Is Vegeta somehow getting stronger? Piccolo responds and says, no, looks like Moro's actually getting weaker. They both look to the sky and see a giant ball of ki, almost like a spirit bomb. Vegeta kicks Moro one more time and we see more ki leaving his body. In that moment, Moro's beard returned. Moro is furious and injured. He says, what have you done? Vegeta responds, still as confident as ever. All the spirits you stole for yourself, those souls, that life energy, I simply liberated it. Vegeta then raises his fist to the sky and then open his palm, causing all the energy Moro gathered to disperse back into the universe. We see Vegeta Sensei on Yard Rat saying, the spirit energy stolen by that Moro guy is returning to the planets it came from. Vegeta did it. Piccolo landing next to Goku says, what's this move he's using? Explain. Goku then tells Piccolo, it's forced spirit fission. It tears apart things that were combined through fusion or absorption. Goku continues, I've never actually seen it used before. Vegeta turns to Piccolo with a smile and says, yes, I could even extract those Namekians you combined with ages ago care to try. Goku says, good Vegeta. I never managed to learn that move. Proud Vegeta responds, of course not. We underwent the same training, but I'm more talented than you. Victory is mine this time, Kakarot. In what seems like a last feeble effort, Moro leaps to the sky and fires an attack at Vegeta. But Vegeta dodges it and connects with a powerful kick to Moro's midsection. Vegeta, talking to Moro, says, to be honest, this never sat well with me. Absorption, fusion, and all that stuff. It doesn't reflect one's inherent power. All I crave is a fair fight. So Moro, why don't you stop relying on the strength you stole from others and simply fight with your own power? Or is your own power even enough to keep you standing? The fight continues and every time Vegeta connects with Moro, he releases more and more of the energy Moro stole back into the universe. Someone on Yardrat asks Vegeta's teacher, when those planets get their life energy, will the inhabitants be revived? And he responds, no. Too much time has passed for most of those alien races to come back to life. However, revival should be possible for tribes with potent life force. And then we see on New Planet Namek, many of the Namikians Moro killed returning back to life. Vegeta is literally resurrecting the people he once killed indiscriminately. At one point, Vegeta looks up to Jacko and says, do you want this one captured alive or should I eliminate the problem altogether? Jacko says, crush him, please. I mean, duh. We were only keeping him locked up because there was nobody who could kill him. If you can be the executioner, be my guest. You heard him, Vegeta said with a smile on his face. Sadly for you, I'm no naive fool like Kakarot. You'll regret ever breaking out of prison once you're in hell. So, Moro says, you believe you're not going to hell? Vegeta responds, when I die, of course I'm going to hell. At the end of the day, I'm a villain too. I've been prepared for that for quite some time. Right, Moro says with a smile now. But you first, wait for me down there. Once I'm dead, I'll pop by and say hello. Moro then gives Vegeta a big smile and says, I have no intention of going to hell. I'll be too busy ruling over the galaxy for all eternity. I still have my magic. And with that, Moro summons a wall of lava in front of him and then disappears. Jackal points to the sky and says he's up there. Vegeta quickly chases after. Moro then lands on the surface of his ship where 7-3 and one of his henchmen are waiting. He kills the henchman and then grabs 7-3. He says, fortunately for me, I planned ahead and kept a backup inside you just in case. In the next panel, we see Moro devouring 7-3's entire body. Vegeta says, what the heck are you doing? Vegeta throws an attack at him, destroying the entire ship and creating a cloud of dust and smoke. But as the smoke clears, something is different about Moro. Vegeta comes crashing down to the ground. He's forced out of Super Saiyan Blue. Everyone looks up to see that Moro has achieved a new transformation. Pretty cool from head to toe, he looks like a young man now. He has a confident smirk on his face and then says, it wasn't only my magic I had 7-3 copy. Goku said, what do you mean? What else was in him? Moro responds, my combat abilities. I was able to create a complete backup within him. Shocked, Gohan says, and you just absorbed 7-3? Moro smiles and says, 
yes, including his ability. This has restored me to my former glory and more. At last, you people came so very close. In the next chapter, Moro begins to decimate the Z Warriors. He starts by grabbing the back of Vegeta's neck, copying his powers, letting him know that he no longer has to deal with a 30 minute time limit. He then defeats Vegeta with his own Big Bang attack. Next. Gohan and Piccolo try to restrain Moro, while Goku hits him with a point blank Kamehameha. At first, it seems like the attack worked because Moro's left arm is destroyed. But because Moro has Piccolo's regeneration abilities, he casually walks up to Goku and instantly regenerates his hand directly through Goku's chest. It's one of the most gruesome scenes we've ever seen in Dragon Ball. Moro's entire arm making a giant hole through Goku's body. Goku falls to his knees on Moro's leg and then Moro kicks him away. Seeing this, Gohan attacks but he's also defeated in a single blow. Dende then contacts Piccolo telepathically letting him know that he's on his way to try and heal everyone. But because 7-3 had already copied Piccolo, Moro is able to listen in on their telepathic conversation. Moro used a bit of his key to place a dome over the fighting area, stopping Dende or anyone else from getting in. He then proceeds to defeat Android 17 and 18 in a single attack and shoot Piccolo through the chest with a special beam cannon. Everyone is down for the count. Seeing this, Dende begins to cry, but then a hole opens up allowing him into Moro's barrier. He hears a voice that says, this isn't over yet god of earth. He turns around and sees the staff of an angel. Jacko tries to make a final stand against Moro, shooting at him with his laser gun, but then out of nowhere, a second laser approaches Moro as well. The shots connect, creating a bit of a dust cloud, but that quickly clears to reveal that Miris has joined the fight. Miris first starts the fight in his usual unorthodox way. He's using a mechanical pole that is very similar to Goku's extended power pole and he somehow managed to push Moro back. But Moro quickly figures out that Miris is more than he seems. He says, are you some manner of deity? Miris's distraction allowed time for Dende to get the defeated Z Warriors outside of Moro's dome. It also reveals that Whis and Beerus have traveled to Earth and that's why Miris is now here to participate in the fight. Dende is able to heal Goku and he lets him know that Miris is currently fighting against Moro. Hearing this, Goku knows that that will lead to Miris being erased. So Goku very quickly rejoins the fight. Goku instantly transforms into Ultra Instinct Sign and attack Moro, but it isn't enough. Moro is able to easily predict and dodge Goku's attacks. Beerus, who says that he's only on earth to get some tasty food, is having a chat with Whis and says, Goku is having another go at it with Sign. Can he win? Whis responds flatly by saying, I very much doubt it. And with that, Goku is pushed back by Moro and knocked out of Sign. Moro says, that form of yours already failed to defeat me once. You think this time it'll be different? Goku says, damn it. You spent all this time teaching me Ultra Instinct and I still can't get the hang of it. Miris responds to him saying, not quite Goku. Your training worked. One last push should trigger it. In that moment, Moro sends a secret attack through the ground behind Miris, grabbing the back of his neck. He says, I don't know who you are, but copying your ability should prove useful. But Miris very casually summons his angel staff and destroys Moro's arm. Miris then says that copy power is a hassle, so I'll have to seal it. Still flying away, Beerus could sense that Miris has started to use his angelic powers. He says to Whis, feels like Miris just started using those angel powers. You sure about all this? Whis responds with a smile. As you know, Lord Beerus, I do not act except under your direct command. Unimpressed, Beerus says, you sneaky little, so the Grand Priest is gonna be pissed at me. Let's get back there and stop him. In that same moment, Moro charges Miris and Goku. Miris tells Goku, Goku, I was born an angel, meant to maintain the neutral position outside of good and evil. As he's saying this, he pins Moro to the ground. In a single strike, he cracks the crystal in Moro's left arm that allows him to copy the abilities of others. He continues talking to Goku saying, so even if the universe is ravaged or destroyed, I'm supposed to sit back and watch. However, through my time working alongside the Galactic Patrol, something blossomed inside me. A sense of justice. The Galactic Patrol agents may be the elites of their home world, but on the universal scale, 
they're helpless. Many of the criminals willing to violate galactic law are far stronger than those agents. Even so, the agents act in accordance with their convictions and ideals. Valiantly, they struggle to protect the galaxy. As he's talking to Goku, Miris manages to casually toss Moro into the air and then use his angelic staff as a laser gun and shoot out the second crystal in Moro's right hand this time. Miris continues to say, seeing those agents in action, I came to realize that peace in the galaxy is worth hanging on to. And with that last sentence, Miris begins to fade. But he continues to talk. He says, meeting you and your people, Goku, only further strengthen my resolve. He then says, my next attack will most likely be my last. He summons his angelic halo and charges at Moro, breaking the crystal on his forehead. With that, he seals the ability for Moro to copy the abilities of others. In the sky, Miris's body begins to fade. He looks back at Goku with a smile and says, Goku, should you achieve Ultra Instinct at your current strength, it will be far more stable than ever before. You will not fall to Moro, nor to anyone else for that matter. Now almost completely transparent and with most of his body gone, Mira says, I've come to love this galaxy, this universe full of excitement. Please protect it all. And in that moment, Miris is erased. For a second, it feels like Goku is on the verge of erupting into a rage, but he instead takes a deep breath. He says to Jacko, who's standing right next to him, why'd you join the Galactic Patrol? Jacko responds, I wanted to preserve peace in the galaxy. Duh. Also, the uniform is just the awesomest. Goku says, right. Miris felt the same way. Right now, I'm a Galactic Patrol agent, just like you. So protecting the universe is my duty too. I can't let Moro have his way with our home. Goku says, Miris may be gone but his will lives on in me and then he begins to power up i have to say this is definitely one of the coolest power up sequence in all of dragon ball i can't wait to see this properly animated goku's key begins to radiate around his body where it eventually shoots out to a massive pillar into the sky the entire time goku's eyes are closed and he's calm almost as if he's meditate off to the side we says we're about to witness ultra instinct perfected. And then in a moment, Goku's key dissipates. His hair is still pointed to the sky, his head looking straight up. Then in the next panel, he's looking straight at Moro. His first time transforming into Ultra Instinct perfected since the Tournament of Power. Staring at Goku, Moro unwillingly takes a step back, almost as if his body is reacting out of fear. Moro steals himself, yelling stay back, and tries to throw an attack at Goku. But Goku pretty much teleports to him before the attack can leave his hand. He grabs Moro by the wrist. Moro follows up with a kick, but Goku casually dodges, saying you won't harm the earth anymore. Moro's next attack is a straight handed punch that Goku dodges and deflects, sending Moro flying. Moro now is enraged and charges at Goku, sending a flurry of kicks and punches. But without even looking at him, Goku either dodges or deflects them all. Off to the side, Beerus says he's fine tuning his moves more and more. Frustrated, Moro says, but how did you? How are you dodging like that? Goku says, not thinking. Moro says, what? Goku continues, my body is acting on its own and deciding how to dodge, which is why your attacks can't hit me. Furious, Moro powers up to his full power again. He charges at Goku, but Goku prepares himself for the attack. Mid charge, he catches Moro with invisible key and raises him into the air. With Moro hovering above him, he takes a deep breath, crouches down, and connects with an uppercut to Moro's midsection. The blow is so powerful, it sends shockwaves reverberating around the entire earth. Moro is sent flying into the sky. Off to the side, Beerus says, perfectly done. We smiles and says, a rare show of respect from you, Beerus. Beerus responds, respect where it's due. The way he fights, it's godlike. And then for the first time, Goku notices that Beerus and Whis are there. He says, Lord Beerus, Whis, you guys are here? Beerus follows up, don't stop now. Finish the job so we can go eat. Moro then comes crashing back down to earth, heavily wounded. Goku says to him, you realize now that you can't beat me, right? Goku continues to talk as Moro forces himself to stand. Goku says, are you starting to understand the pain and suffering of everyone you've killed? Do you get how that feels now? Silence, Moro says. How dare you presume to lecture me? You must think yourself a god. Know this, I do not fear divine power. I am Moro, consumer of worlds. The gods' creations are mine to devour. I am this galaxy's supreme life form. 
Moriel's as he summons pillars of lava from Earth's core. He continues, whether this planet lives or dies is up to me. Which would serve me better? Think on that. He then attempts to surprise Goku with an attack from behind, but again, without looking at him, Goku kicks him into one of his own lava pillars. Moro is heavily burned and damaged. Goku says, you're done Moro. Earth is not your plaything anymore. Moro smiles and says, you care for this planet to that extent? Then my next act will be to consume it. But then instantly, another powerful kick to Moro's midsection, sending him flying, crashing into a giant rock. As Moro attempts to crawl back to his feet, the rock breaks, falling on him and crushing his body. Only his right arm is visible. He says in a meek voice, help me, please don't kill me. Goku looking at him says to Jacko, hey Jacko, he was sentenced to death, right? Jacko says, yeah, he was. Do you mind doing the deed for us? I see. Goku continues. In that case, he says, while ripping off his galactic patrol emblem, let me fight him as an earthling from here on. The next chapter starts with Goku dissolving the rock that was crushing Moro. He then teleports to Krillin and grabs the bag of Senchu beans that Krillin's been carrying with him. Goku teleports back to Moro and says, stand up Moro, I'll spare you if you agree to go back to the galactic patrol prison and promise not to break out ever again. Moro simply can't believe it. He says, yes, of course, I swear it. You'll have no more trouble for me. Goku then flicks him a sensu bean. Moro says, what might this be? Goku lets him know that eating that will instantly restore your stamina. Eat it, then Jacko will take you back to prison. Moro then eats the sensu bean, recovering his full health. I just gotta stop here for a second because this was probably the most infuriating thing that I'd ever read in Dragon Ball at the time. I don't wanna go on too much about it here, but to write this into the story that Goku will want to heal Moro and keep him alive for the purpose of potentially fighting him later while ignoring all the pain and suffering and death that Moro will cause, it made me feel like Goku was regressing as a character, not evolving like Vegeta clearly did with the Namekians, for example. Anyway, let's continue. After Moro heals, Goku says to him, and now you'll keep your promise? Moro smiles and says, naturally I'm grateful son Goku, but I'm afraid I'm not going anywhere, at least not until you die by my hand. Moro attacks Goku, but ends up breaking his arm on Goku's chest. Goku looking at him unfazed says, you're just a sneaky coward. In your current strength, you could never hope to defeat me. He then powers down looking at Moro in the eyes and says, have you ever trained? Moro says, I have not, obviously. Goku says, you might end up even stronger if you trained instead of eating planets and stealing lives. Moro says, silence. Training is a crutch for the weak. Disappointed, Goku says, that's a real shame because I never came across anyone as tough as you. If you were a decent guy, I'd love to fight you again after you'd gone through some training. Jacko is just shocked by all this. He says, hey Goku, he just went back on his word. Stop expecting some magical change of heart. And for the love of all that's good, just finish him off already. Goku stands up responding to Jacko and says, I know I will. Just let me talk to him a little longer. Goku turns to Moro and says, you'll never enjoy freedom again. Let me ask you one last time. Will you come quietly and go back to prison or not? In that moment, Moro notices his hand that Miris chopped off earlier. It's laying on a rock behind Goku. Goku says, which is it? I need an answer. Moro responds with, I will never return to the galactic prison. In fact, I will continue to consume planets as I please. Goku then says, okay, you leave me no choice because I promised Miris to protect this galaxy. Miris, Moro says, who really was that galactic patrol agent? A teacher of mine, Goku responds. He taught me how to do this, referring to Ultra Instinct. Intriguing. I suppose that means he could use that technique as well? Yeah, Goku responds. And then Moro remembers that he already copied Miris's ability. That's it, he says, pulling his hand towards him and attaching it to his wrist. So the body moves on instinct, does it? I'd love to try that. Moro then switches into Miris's ability, moving the crystal from his hand to his forehead and achieving another transformation. The fur on his back and legs turned to white. The area under his eyes on his face also changed to white. In switching into Miris, Moro has achieved Ultra Instinct himself. He clashes with Goku and the punch sends another round of shockwaves throughout the planet. It creates a crater where they collided. Goku noticing the destruction tells Moro to follow him. Goku is trying to take Moro to a place more secluded, but Moro splits himself, sending one of his copies around the planet to intercept Goku. He kicks him 
down to the ground into a pile of rocks and says, I also have my magic, which gives me a leg up. You think so, Goku responds, then try a little harder. How are you still so calm? I want you quicker than fear, Moro says to him. The two clash again, but this time it seems as if Moro is losing control of his body. His arm and torso begin to grow. Whis to the side says his body is swelling in an attempt to contain the angel power that now courses through it. Goku says, Moro, remember what happened to your man Sangambo? You're making the same mistake. I only mastered this technique after honing my body to withstand it. It's not something you can wield just cause you feel like it. Abandon Miris' abilities or you'll be destroyed by them. Moro says, laughable. You believe I have limits? Surely you recall how many planets I've consumed. Goku says, everyone has a limit and this is yours. Silence, Moro yells as he grows bigger and bigger. Whis yells to Goku. Goku, if you intend to defeat Moro, kill him this instant. Backing him into a corner past this point is unwise. Say goodbye, Moro, Goku says, preparing to attack. But now Goku is too late. A giant Moro face emerges from Earth behind him. It fires a key blast out of its mouth. Goku, shocked, says, you. But how? Moro says, I have become one with this planet of yours. Behold, I've done away with my limits. Whis, disappointed, says, so it's come to this. Killing Moro will mean destroying the earth itself. And beyond that, his swollen energy will detonate, possibly obliterating the entire galaxy. Moro laughs and says, Try me if you dare, Son Goku. In that moment, everyone around the earth feel their energy being drained. Moro says, The earth's energy is all mine, absorbing it all into himself. Realizing that Moro will soon explode, Beerus decides that he's gonna have to end it. But just then, Whis's staff starts to ring. It's the Grand Priest, and he's not very happy with the Mira situation. He's summoning Whis and Beerus that very moment. Before they leave, Whis says to Goku, the only way to defeat Moro is to once again shatter his forehead crystal, thereby releasing Miris' power. Done properly, that will destroy Moro and leave the earth intact. We must return to the angel realm now. Farewell. And with that, Whis and Beerus leave. In that moment, Vegeta comes charging in. He tries using Force Spirit Fission on the ground, which is now part of Moro's body. This stops Moro from hiding the crystal on his forehead within himself. Goku says, nice going Vegeta. His body's deflating. Vegeta responds, enough yapping, destroy that crystal. I can only rip away spirit energy from him for so long. Goku then charges at Moro with one final attack, but before he can make it to the crystal, a series of limbs grab Goku and begin to drain his energy. Don't power down Kakarot, Vegeta yells. Sorry, my power is getting sucked away. In that moment, the other Z warriors land behind Vegeta. Piccolo says, Vegeta, you're spirit fishing. Can you do it in reverse? Vegeta says, what? Piccolo says, I'm asking if you can gather up our key and give it to Goku. Vegeta responds, yes, it's possible. It's the same principle. Great, Piccolo says. You need to give our key to him then. Fine, hand it over, Vegeta says. They all begin handing over their energy to Vegeta. Telepathically, Piccolo says to Dende, Dende, gather up key from everyone at the sanctuary and send it our way. Right, Dende says. Everyone, lend me your power. Even Trunks and Goten hear Piccolo's telepathic message and send their energy to Vegeta. Vegeta then says, I'll add my own key to the mix. Take this, Kakarot. He throws it at Goku which allows Goku to power up back into Super Saiyan Blue. Piccolo says, that's just his blue form. Why won't he use Ultra Instinct? No, he can't, Vegeta responds. Not even with the key from all of us. Dende says, I'm sorry, Goku. My own divine power is still developing, so it doesn't help you so much. But then, out of nowhere, a massive ball of divine energy comes flying towards Goku. Where did that come from? Vegeta says, this ridiculous amount. Who sent it? On the next panel, we see the Daiokai Shin the great lord of lords, standing next to his reincarnation, Oob. Oob had just finished raising his hand to the sky, sending his god key to Goku. Take it and use it, Vegeta yelled, for another round of Ultra Instinct. He throws the key at Goku, and Goku transforms into a giant avatar of himself. Goku's giant god key avatar locks hands with Moro, pushing him back into the earth. Goku himself turns back into Ultra Instinct while hovering in his avatar's forehead. In what then looks like a headbutt between monsters, Goku's avatar brings his head close to Moro's, and Goku himself flies out to deliver a punch to Moro's crystal. Flying away, Whis looks back and smiles as the crystal shatters. Moro explodes, and Goku gives everyone the thumbs up. In the final chapter of this arc, everyone who is aware of the situation is celebrating at Moro's defeat. Even the yard 
rats and the Namikians. The narrator then lets us know that after saying goodbye, Goku teleported with Eska back to New Planet Namek. They used the Dragon Balls to restore the planets that were caught up in Moro's wake and revived the beings who he killed. And so, the universe was back to the way it was, except for a certain angel trainee. The story shows that several days later, Goku, Vegeta, Jackal, and Majin Buu are being honored at the Galactic Patrol headquarters. The four of them receive medals, when suddenly, the Galactic Patrol officer mentions the final person to receive a medal. Goku says, hmm, there's someone else? The officer then announces, Miris, huh? Goku says, and from behind the crowd, Miris walks to the front, right here. Miris responds. Shocked, Goku says, Miris, it's really you. Goku, Vegeta, Miris says. I'm glad to see you again. How are you alive? Vegeta says. Didn't you cease to exist? Yes, I did cease to exist, Miris says. As an angel, that is. We then see that Shin approached the Grand Priest and begged for Miris to get a second chance. And so, Beerus and Shin were forced to play with Zeno and give his guards a break, while Miris was allowed to be resurrected as a mortal. The story ends with the narrator saying, and with that, Goku and his friends' time in the Galactic Patrol was over guys that was it the full story of the moro arc i hope you enjoyed it i definitely enjoyed it more my second time reading it be sure to support the official release if anyone made it this far in the video hashtag moral arc in the comments below that's it for me i hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day i will be talking to you again as soon as i can bye